Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. this is your first time here, welcome here. We're glad to have you. We are uh, starting today a new book of the Bible. We're going to spend time in the book of Philippians. The reason that, uh, um, yeah, we just got done with 2 Timothy and we'll move, we'll move into the book of Philippians. And I'll explain a little bit of why I think it's good time for that for us right now. So if you've got a checkbook, you can go ahead and open it. If you've got a Bible, you can open it as well. You can open it to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians is just like Second Timothy in that it is a letter written to a church that Paul planted. Paul was a missionary, and he, he, he specifically targeted major cities. So he would go into metropolitan areas, and he would preach the gospel. There would be some that would respond to the good news of Jesus Christ, And then he would take those that responded and he would plant a church with them. So this is what he spent his, he spent 30 years doing this. And if you remember um, last week, was it last week? Yeah, we we finished the book of 2 Timothy, which were Paul's last words. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about the context of Philippians as we go along. We'll talk about um, what that church was facing there in Philippi. Um, And we'll get to know exactly what they were up against. Um, as we go forward, um, this this letter, though, that Paul writes to the Philippian church is very unique um, in that this is the only letter that Paul writes where he's not trying to correct or modify behavior. This is a friendship letter that he writes to the church in Philippi. Most of the time when we read Paul and his letters to the churches that he planted, um, he's trying to correct them. He's saying, stop this. Quit that. Are you kidding me? Are you serious? Don't make me come over there. Uh, With the Galatians, he uses really strong words. You idiots. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you? Most of the time when we read Paul, he's trying to correct or modify some behavior inside his church. This letter holds no criticism for his hearers, for its hearers. Um, For this reason, the book of Philippians provides us with this really cool glimpse of Christian maturity. Uh, Many many of the other churches that Paul planted uh, serve as an example of what not to do. When we read 1 Corinthians, we get a lot of what not to do. When we read most of Paul's letters to his churches, we get a good example of what not to do. The church in Philippi is a group of maturing believers. And Paul loves these guys. He doesn't talk to any church the way he talks to this church. Listen to what he says in in, uh, chapter 1. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. 
God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. What a strong statement. God can testify how I long for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. I don't even say that to my wife. Paul's saying it to this church. He loves this church. This church is his baby. Um, Paul, Paul is not, not unlike the, the waiter who most of the time in the kitchen is pretty upset. And then as he comes to the table is like, hey, what can I get started for you guys? You know, you've seen that before where the waiter's like, I told you to refill nine. Did you refill nine? I told you this is supposed to be medium well. This is medium well. Hey, how you doing? What can I get started for you guys? Most of the time he's talking to people pretty harshly. And then when he gets to the church in Philippi, um, yeah, he, uh, he doesn't talk to anyone like he talks to these guys. So um, I want to take a, a, just give you a, an idea of why, why Philippians, why the book of Philippians, uh, why now as a church. And um, there are a lot of things that we can study in the Bible. Why would we study the book of Philippians right now as a church? And it's real simple. I want to experience the meal that this menu describes. Philippians is like a menu, and when I read it, I'm going, I want to experience the meal that this menu describes. I want what it has to offer. I want the things that this book talks about, not only for my own life personally, but also for our church corporately. Some of the themes that emerge in the book of Philippians, and I know that many of you have probably read the book of Philippians, but some of the themes that emerge are... are, um, And some of the things that I want personally and some of the things I want for our church, one of those themes is is unity. The Philippian church um, is united. And their unity is the byproduct of mission. They're together advancing the gospel. And so their unity is not a means to having uh, better potlucks together. Their unity is the byproduct of advancing the gospel together. It's unity for the sake of advancing the gospel. And I really want to spend some time these next 12 weeks talking about unity. What is it? What are the things that help it? What are the things that get in the way of it? How can we have it together as a church? Obviously, there's a huge theme of joy in the book of Philippians. And as I read it, I found myself going, I want this. I want it personally, and I want it corporately as a church. I want to experience this. I want what this book is talking about. We live in a country that was founded as a social experiment in the pursuit of joy. You're promised life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness which I think is really interesting because they could promise life, they could promise liberty, but all they could promise you was that you could pursue happiness. So now for a couple hundred years, we have been pursuing happiness. And it's not going so well for us. Right? We're looking for it in culture, we've been looking for it in religion, we've been looking for it in all kinds of places, and it's not going well for us. The number one category of prescription drugs is antidepressants. There's 118 million people on antidepressants, and this is up 48% from 95 to 2002. And I'm not trying to share this like this is good or bad. I'm just telling you that our pursuit isn't going so well. It's just a little feedback for us. It's not going so hot. We're not as happy as we had hoped. We've been pursuing this for a couple hundred years, and we're not doing so well. I want to talk about the things that steal joy and the things that enable joy, um, where we find our joy. Can we have joy in suffering? Can we have joy in poverty? Can we have joy in anxiety and in loneliness? This should be a great topic to talk about in our growth groups. If you haven't signed up for a growth group during the week, we're going to talk about the sermon on Sunday. We're going to talk about unity, talk about joy. 
Uh, One of the other things that I want that Philippians talks about is an eternal perspective. The famous passage where Paul says our citizenship is in heaven is in Philippians. What does it mean to be in but not of the world? And to have our minds set on things above and not have our minds set on earthly things. I think that this might be directly connected to our joy. The other thing that I want that I read about in Philippians is humility. We can't hear enough about this. If you're here and and you came in here with some problems, I'm telling you that your problem is pride and that the answer to your problem is humility. I know that may seem presumptuous for me to know what you're going through right now and what the answer is, but your problem is most likely pride and the answer is most likely humility. We can't hear enough about this. Philippians 2 is a famous passage where it talks about Jesus Christ as our example who humbled himself. Uh, Contentment is a huge theme in the book of Philippians. And I would love to have some more conversations about contentment. And plenty and in want. Um, The other thing that I want is gratefulness. The famous passage that says, do everything without grumbling and complaining comes from Philippians. And we know that there's probably a deep connection between our gratitude and joy. As I read the book of Philippians, I found myself wanting to get a handle on my thought life. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. We'll talk in our growth groups and we'll talk on Sunday morning about our thought life. About the conversations that we're having with ourselves. I want peace instead of anxiety. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So these would be some of the themes that we're hitting in the next 12 weeks. So it should be a really good time. I'm really excited to experience together. Um, corporately, some of these things that the book of Philippians talks about. Today, we're actually not going to turn to Philippians, which is what I told you to do earlier, correct? Let's go ahead. I knew it probably took you a long time to find that little book too, huh? Let's turn to the book of Acts, because we're going to talk about how the church got started. In order to understand this letter to the Philippians, it's good to understand how this church got kicked off. And as I read about how this church got started, I got super excited. And it may not, I may not seem super excited right now, but I am. Uh, every church has really unique stories in, in, in how they began. But really, nothing, nothing that I've heard compares to how this church in Philippi got started. I could tell you some really funny stories about how Radiant Church began and about how it got started. Um, I could talk to you about what it was like to plant Radiant. And one of the things that happened when we planted Radiant Church is that Tiff and I um, assembled a group of people. We gathered a group of people around us who shared some of our values, who shared some of our concerns. We had a lot in common with these people. We grabbed a bunch of people that were just like us. We did. Um, They were a similar age. They had a similar taste in, in music. They were a lot like us. We had similar beliefs, and not only did we have uh, similar beliefs, but we, our, our philosophy for ministry was in alignment, too. And so we gathered this core of people, and we planted the church with a small group that had a lot in common. That is so far from what happened in Philippi. And we get to read about it today. 
In Acts chapter 16, we'll start in verse uh, 12. This is describing Paul's missionary journey to Philippi. And we're going to read in the book of Acts how this church got started. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So the first person that Paul shares the gospel with in Philippi is this woman, Lydia. And Lydia is from Thyatira. Racially, she is Asian. And she is from Thyatira, but she also has a home in Philippi. So get this. The first person that Paul makes contact with is an Asian fashion designer who has a home in both New York and Los Angeles. (laughs) This is who he comes in contact with. This is a successful woman. This gal has done well for herself. She's wealthy. She's probably driven. I can't even handle one mortgage, let alone two. I've I've had that thought a few times. We've had to short sell a home, and I thought to myself, I can't handle one mortgage. How do you do two? She's got homes in Thyatira and in Philippi. And it says about her that she is a God worshiper. Now, what this means is that she's rejected paganism. She believes there's a God. And she's also rejected polytheism. She doesn't think there's many gods. She believes in one God. She believes in one God, but she's not come to believe in Jesus as God. Have you you met this person before? <laughs> this woman believes there's a God, but she hasn't received Jesus as God. And she's at the synagogue because she's a seeker. She's successful. She's driven. She's an intellect. She's seeking God. She wants answers. And Paul finds her, and, and, and notice how, I just want you to notice how Paul appeals to her. Because he engages this woman in conversation, and it's Paul's message that opens her heart to the gospel. Do you know this person, you know, the person who's an intellectual, uh, the, the fashion designer, lives in major cities, believes there's a God, they're a seeker? but they don't receive Jesus as God? Do you come in contact with this person? In this setting, what I want you to notice is that Paul appeals to her intellect. She's seeking answers and he has a conversation with her. He gives her the information and and, and there's revelation that comes to her and opens up her heart. She's been listening to the scriptures, so she understands Torah, and she knows that there's a law, and she knows that she falls short and, uh, of the standard that God set. And then Paul gets to jump in and talk about Jesus as the atonement, as the sacrifice. Paul jumps in and gets to talk about Jesus as the one who's made a way. And she responds in faith, but Paul appeals to her intellect, and he has a conversation with this seeker. Let's go on and read. Verse 16, he moves on. 
Once they were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. So this is the next person that Paul meets in Philippi. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left her. This girl has nothing in common with Lydia. Lydia is in control. She's driven. She's successful. This girl is enslaved and is out of control. She's manic. She's disruptive. And watch how Paul deals with her. Notice how Paul deals with her. Because he doesn't appeal to her intellect. He doesn't sit her down to have a conversation. To say, so how's this going for you, you know, being enslaved? I mean, what do you think about all this? He doesn't appeal to her, to her intellect and, and try to reason with this woman who's bound. He doesn't appeal to her intellect and say, hey, do you know how much money you'd make if you just worked an honest job? This isn't working out so well. He doesn't try to reason to her. He skips the head and goes right, right to the heart. And in an act of Holy Ghost power, he commands the thing that's ruled over her to come out. He doesn't even speak to her. He speaks to it. The thing that's controlled her. And he commands it to come out. And I want you to notice a a couple things. Because this girl was a slave. She was a slave on the outside, but she was also a slave on the inside. She had given in to some things, and if I, if I were a betting man, I would bet it was probably bitterness and rejection. I can imagine that her parents probably sold her into slavery. I could imagine that not only was she a slave on the outside, but she was an enslaved on the inside. She was enslaved to bitterness because of what had happened to her. She was enslaved to rejection because of what happened to her. And there are some of you today where you are enslaved to bitterness and rejection. It dictates what you do. You can't seem to get free of the bitterness that you feel. And no matter how much people talk to you and try to reason with you, it never dislodges the bitterness and the rejection that you feel. You make up in every circumstance that you're rejected. And you don't do this for no reason. You've probably got good reasons to believe that you've been rejected. Maybe your parents, like this girl's parents, left you. And so you, now you've decided that you, you know, you've been abandoned and you've been rejected. And now it dictates what you do and what you say and how you think. Paul doesn't try to reason with this girl. He calls it out and he commands it to leave. I think another thing that was really interesting to me as I read this, I I felt slightly convicted because the other thing that Paul doesn't say is like, hey, I'm having a seminar about demon possession. He doesn't say, "Um, come to the miracle meeting. He brings the miracle to her, full of the Holy Spirit. Paul reasons with Lydia and she opens her heart. It's power that opens this girl's heart. It's the Holy Spirit. Not that the Holy Spirit wasn't also a part of opening Lydia's mind. But there's a miracle that opens this girl's heart to the gospel. He commands the Spirit. He doesn't converse with it. He doesn't even engage the Spirit in conversation. He commands it. The next person we meet in Acts 16, the next member of the church in Philippi is a Roman jailer. Read with me um, 
starting in verse 19. When her owners, the slave girl's owners, realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, when most of us think of stocks, we... um, We think of the stocks that held your hands and head in the Middle Ages, but these weren't the stocks of the first century. In the first century, when you put someone in stocks, they would actually contort your body. It was actually a form of torture. So it wasn't a form of safekeeping. Putting you in stocks was a form of torture. They would contort your body and then they would leave you in that position for hours so that your body would cramp and seize up. So what you think of when you think of stocks are not the stocks that Paul and Silas are in. I know when I've pictured this Bible story, I see Paul and Silas, you know, hands out, head out, singing worship songs. But that's not the type of stocks these guys were in. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and they were singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to him. Paul, they had to cut Paul's head off to shut him up. This is a frustrating guy. If you hate the gospel, this guy is frustrating. You better stop that. We'll kill you. Hey, to die is gain. We'll torture you. Well, I don't... These sufferings in this life are nothing compared to the glory I'll get in the next. We'll throw you in prison. Great, I'll sing and I'll write some letters that will forever encourage the church. (laughs) All right, fine. Well, then we'll let you live. To live is Christ, man. To live is Christ. (laughs) This guy's unreal. So suddenly there's this violent earthquake and the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had had escaped. Now, in, um, in these days, if you... We're trying to think of the. Uh, in these days, I'm trying to think of the way, the best way to say this. As a prison guard, you were responsible for those who escaped. And they would take your life if those, you know, if. if, if you get what I'm saying, right? Do I have to find some cute way to say this? They were going to kill him because he was responsible for these guys who escaped. And it was punishable by death. Where did I leave off? Okay, Paul shouts, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Unreal. This guy is torturing Paul. The prison doors fly open. And Paul doesn't make a run for it. The jailer should be the one making a run for it. But this guy is so duty-bound. This ex-GI who's manning the cell is so duty-bound that he's about to fall on his sword. He's not going to try to run. He's not even going to try to wait to see if he can get forgiven for what happened. You know, he probably would have had a pretty good excuse to tell his boss an earthquake came, you know. They, these guys may have escaped on my watch, but this was supernatural. You should have been here. Maybe they, would have, maybe they would have forgiven him. Rather than wait and try to tell his boss, and rather than try to escape, 
This guy is so duty bound that he's going to take his own life. He's going to fall on his sword. The jailer, uh, Paul, Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all heal, we're here. And the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out, and he asked them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all of his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. This uh, Roman jailer, this is a blue-collar dude. He's not the fashion designer with two homes. He's not rich. He's also not poor like the slave girl. This is an ex-GI who's been stationed inside this prison. Duty bound. You know the guy. I just want to do my job. I want to go home. I want to have a beer. And I want to watch the game. He's not all intellectual, pondering, you know, the reason for, the reason for life. Like Lydia. He's not a seeker. He's not enslaved and emotional like the slave girl. He's indifferent. He's cruel. He's duty bound. He wants to do his job and he wants to be left alone and he wants to go home. This is the third person that makes up the first three that start the church in Philippi. And I want you to notice, how does, how does Paul win this guy over? Actions. He didn't talk to this guy. There's no power encounter. He wins this guy over with actions. And I find this to be the truth with with most blue-collar guys. They're not interested in talking about it. They don't want to get all emotional about it. What they care about is that you live it. They want to see the proof. He doesn't say a word to this guy. What he shows him is a greater allegiance. Can you imagine the doors fling open and Paul's like, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. Hey, man. Paul's Roman. Paul understands that if Paul leaves, this guy will be executed. Paul gets this and he stands in and he stands up. And he basically says, hey, we're, we're, <laughs> we're not going anywhere. The church in Philippi was started because the gospel transformed a rich Asian fashion designer, a young slave, and a Roman jailer. Can you imagine that first church meeting? Puy. Hey, you know, my, <laughs> I'm Lydia. I'm a fashion designer. I have homes in New York and Los Angeles. I, I'm a CEO. I'm driven. I'm successful. Hey, my name's Bird. I work at the jail. <laughs> Can we get this over with? <laughs> hey, I'm the goth girl in the corner. I'm not talking to anyone. I've got a trench coat on. I'm bitter and I'm rejected and I'm oppressed. What a start. We're talking about the first church in Europe. Man. This is not man's wisdom. I never, when we were planting a church, was told by someone to go look for a rich Asian intellect fashion designer, then go find a jailer, then go find a demon-possessed girl. You know, that... Man, God. The 
the gospel, it, it, it transforms. It'll transform a Roman jailer who's blue collar. It'll transform people that are indifferent and cruel. It'll transform the fashion designer. It'll transform the CEO. It'll transform a slave girl who's bitter and angry and oppressed and hurt. What a start. I think what I wanted to communicate this morning is that the gospel can't be stopped by the walls that we build as humans. In an instant, the gospel defied race, status, class, age, history, and now a brand new community is birthed. People who had nothing in common with each other are now gathered together making up the church in Philippi. If you're honest, like me, you do life with people who are similar to you who like the things that you like and listen to the music that you listen to. They laugh at the same things that you do and enjoy the same movies. You go to church with people who are similar to you. Your good friends, at some level, they, they think like you do. And the gospel blew through all of these walls and launched this new community in Philippi. And what I wanted to say this morning is as humans, we can begin to believe that there are certain types of people that become Christians. We decide that it's certain types of people that become Christians. And then we assume that there are those that are probably just too far out there. Are you intimidated by the intellect? I want you to know that Lydia had a lot of things going for her, and she was empty. Paul wasn't intimidated by what he saw on the outside. He knew that she was empty. Are you intimidated by those that are demonized, that are manic, that are disruptive, Or do you believe that the gospel can transform those people? Are you intimidated by the blue-collar GI? Just wants to be left alone. He's indifferent. Or can the gospel transform that guy? I wanted to ask the question this morning as we As we close, who are the people that you do life with that don't know Jesus? The people that you come in contact with on a daily basis that don't know about the good news of Jesus Christ, His life, His death, His resurrection, and what it means for us. What are the relationships that you have? Not, listen, like, Paul didn't even go looking for this demon-possessed gal. And this jailer was just in his path. He didn't even go out looking for these guys. But he seized the opportunity to share the gospel with them when he came across them. What are the relationships that you have that you've not brought the gospel into because for some reason or another you're afraid or intimidated? You've decided that they they won't be interested. Oh, they don't want to hear about this. They won't be interested in this. This story from Acts 16 teaches us that there is no one that God can't transform by the power of the gospel. There's no one outside God's power to transform through Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter how much money you make. doesn't matter the circumstances that you face. What 
What, what reasons do you have for not sharing the gospel boldly? Why are you hesitating? We went up the hill as a group of elders, and we began to pray. Um, and we had a lot of things to get through. There were a lot of things that we needed to have conversations about and decide on. And in the middle of our conversation, uh, something came up. And uh, that something helped bring shape to the rest of our time together. We began to talk about what if, what if we could believe God to reach 150 people this year with the gospel? that they would respond to Jesus' invitation to them, and that they, they would actually enter the waters of baptism. And we just felt, and I don't know if it was that we didn't want to talk about how to work out ushers or other things like that, but we got completely swept up in this conversation of what if? What if God through us this year would use us to reach 150 people? that 150 people this year would be baptized. They would follow Jesus into the waters of baptism and express their commitment to him by identifying themselves with Christ. And we just started to light up. What would we do then? How would we shape this year? What would we talk about this year if this was our goal? And of course, then we started to have conversations about numbers. That's kind of strange. Should we share that with the church that we're believing for 150 people? Because one of the first things that came up is Eric was like, we can't do this. And we were like, yes, we can't do this. We can't do this. And we just started to get excited on the inside. We can't do this. We could probably find some ushers. We can't do this. It was an exciting conversation. And uh, we actually want to unite this year with you and advance the gospel. We're believing. This isn't just a joke, you know, and, and this is really, this is about the numbers, you know. Well, 150, you know, it's not about the numbers, it's about what God wants to do. Numbers represent people. And God wants those people. It is about numbers. Numbers. Because it's about people. And we want to unite as a church to advance the gospel. The unity that the church in Philippi experienced was a byproduct of being together on mission. I'm asking you, who are the people that you do life with? Who are the people that you're with on a daily basis where you have not brought the gospel into that relationship? Because you're intimidated. Maybe you're scared. Maybe you've decided what they need. Maybe you've decided and assumed what God can do in their life. We can't do 150 people, but I know that there's probably 175 here. I don't actually even know what we do with 150 more people, but we'll figure it out. And we're going to contend for this this year. And there will be a unity that comes as a byproduct of joining together, praying together that the gospel would go forth. The gospel can, in, it can transform the wealthy, it can transform the religious, and it can transform the empty. It can transform the indifferent, the cruel, and it can transform the bitter, the oppressed, and the angry. Do you live with faith in the gospel? Do you live with faith in the gospel? I want to do something this morning. I, 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 I really do want you to bring to mind, maybe the Holy Spirit, I would hope, is putting someone on your heart that He's asking you to pray for this year and to speak to about Jesus. But I'd like to end our time this morning um, by taking communion together. And what I'd like you to do, this might be a little bit tough, um, because of, the, because of the way this church is made up. But I want you to come to the table. 
Um, but I want you to come to the table with somebody who's different than you. Would you find someone younger than you are? Would you find someone who's a different race? If you're dressed nice, find someone who's not dressed so nice. If you're slow, find the smartest guy in this room. Come to the table with a complete stranger this morning. Because you've got everything in common. We've been adopted and we have become the family of God. So I'm going to pray. We'll play some music. Don't be scared. Let's celebrate our differences. Walk up to someone that you don't know, who's a different color, seems to be on top of it and you're not, whatever. And come to the table with them. Jesus, thank you for your gospel. Thank you for the good news and thank you for its ability to transform. I want to ask right now that you would unite us this year on a mission to see 150 people respond to your good news. I ask you, Father, to give us your Holy Spirit and empower us to reason with those that are intellectual, to provide power for those that are bound and to live out our faith for those who are looking for something sincere. That Holy Spirit, you would help us to live lives, worthy lives, as Philippians talks about. And we just repent, God, as a church where we've just written people off. We've thought, well, no, certain people get saved who are in certain situations. And we've decided that people are too far gone. And we repent for that. We want to live with faith in the gospel that it's able to transform. Thank you for where you found us. Thank you for the, um, that you brought uh, liberty and freedom to us when we were dealing with all sorts of stuff. I pray that you'd use us to set captives free this year. I'm excited about what you're going to do. And I'm excited about the people that you're wanting to bring into the family of God. Thank you for the differences here in this room. We celebrate the diversity here. And we also thank you, Jesus, for your blood, your broken body that has saved us all. We love you this morning. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantbicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea. And all the beautiful things here in life I'm a, I'm a pilgrim here on the side of the grave Divide